What's up guys, this is Sean Tan and today, unfortunately, our Prime Minister has announced we will be going into a total lockdown again. And first opinion, it sucks, right? Second thought, I think why not we use this opportunity, right, since everybody is at home, me too, right? That's why I emptied out this corner at home to somewhat figure out a new format of things because a common issue that a lot of audience came to me is that they don't know where to start, right? Just when I thought the 600 different episodes on YouTube, it's a good thing. Unfortunately, it has become a factor of overwhelming for a lot of new audience, especially like, Sean, I'm a new person. Like, where do I start and what do I do with all this content, right? So that's why I'm starting this new lecture series. I call it the Property Lecture Series and we will go chapter by chapter. Well, this is my own chapter. Lah. So, so it's not some educational material that is going for accreditation or whatsoever, but it's just good knowledge to know when you are going for a property investment where we will explain basic terminology definition of things before we really can get into the details of whatever that makes a real estate work or whatever makes a master plan work and things like that right so i hope you guys really will enjoy this series and i think let's start with the first chapter These episodes are also a joint collaboration with the team in The Makeover, guys. Yeah, because I also work there. Lah. <laughs> anyway, please enjoy. So the very first chapter, I want to start with what are the types of properties that is available in Malaysia? Because a lot of people are confused with the terminologies of properties. Okay, so let's set it straight once and for all, right? Number one. Every piece of land in Malaysia is gazetted and they will have a birth certificate called the land title, right? In this piece of document, the best part about being in Malaysia is we have the torrent system. A torrent system is an Australian or India-inspired land administration system where the owner will have a copy, the land office will have a copy. So when every time when the ownership needs to be clarified or verified, right, both parties need to match the documents whether is it valid or not. And in Malaysia, generally, it's divided into three main categories. Number one will be agriculture. Number two will be building. Number three will be industrial. Then many people kind of skipped this step, right, of land title issue and they should be jump into residential, commercial. For every type of title, they are express conditions, which means those are the little, little details of what you can or cannot do in the particular plot of land. For example, in agriculture title, you have a five acre, for example. In some titles, they will only say kelapa sahaja, which means you can only plant coconuts. So in some titles, you are allowed to only plant getah rubber estate for example. This applies to the building type of titles as well where in building type then you have residential, you have commercial, then you have mixed development. So this is the part where a lot of people focus on residential usage, commercial usage. So buildings that are built in these type of titles right will be imposed with different types of guidelines and requirements. For example, in residential type of building, you are not required to provide fire sprinklers. But for mixed development and commercial, right, you are supposed to provide fire sprinklers in your unit. Another example would be the calculation of car parks. So for every unit in a residential title project, for every unit of apartment, you need to provide two car parks. But on a commercial project, for example, service apartments, right, every 1,000 square feet, you are required to provide 1.5 unit of car park. So this difference in car park requirements becomes the main driving force of why a lot of developers starts to sway away from residential type of properties. This is just because of the number of units of car park I need to provide as a developer, right? For the same number of units, one residential, one commercial, right? I get to provide way less for a commercial project. And to continue from that, what are the difference in definition between condominiums, service apartments, Soho, Sovo, Sofo, Lifestyle Suites, and etc. I'm not too sure any other terms that I've come across, but generally these are the few popular ones. Lah. Okay, the main definition, number one, condominiums, right? Besides the recent visit to Twai, right? I have not 
came across any other condominiums. And for a building to be called a condominium, there are a very strict criteria to be fulfilled. Number one, it needs to be at least three acres of land. And in every acre, a condo is limited to 50 units only per acre, which means in a land of three acres, I can only build 150 units, which is okay back then, 1980s, 90s. But when it comes to the recent one, Half an acre developers are already building 300 units. It's just not making sense because the land price has went up so high drastically, right? That's the main difference why there are no longer any condos anymore in the market. That's why when you see any condos in the market, it will be very, very suitable for own stay because of the density being super, super low and you will have ample of land generally. So service apartment, by definition, it was supposed to be like a hotel service kind of apartment where you will have a concierge, you will have people coming to your room, providing room service and things like that. So if you look into Four Seasons Residence, right? If you look into it Conley, so those higher ranked properties, right? Those are the real definition of a service apartment where you have a bellboy to help you take luggage from the car when you go vacation, stop taxi for you and etc. Well, now people take grab. Lah. But this terminology of service apartment was a gray area that a lot of developers used to actually leverage on the system where I get to sell more units for the same plot of land and then providing less number of car parks, which improves my profit margin. That's why now what you get, right, is all service apartments. Very rare you come across condo anymore. As service apartments falls under the commercial title, it usually comes with several units of commercial lots. And those are meant to provide convenience for the residents. So based on my personal experience, I've seen mixed development being an express condition on the title um, in JB, but I've not seen any in KL. So the one that I come across in JB is when they demarcate clearly, right? For this piece of land, let's say 10 acres, right? There will be a definition of 50-50. 50-50 means 50% can be used for commercial usage, like shop lots offices, warehouse, and etc. right? Those commercial usage of things and 50% of that mixed development needs to be right, service apartments. Then the lines gets even blurred when you have Soho, where it's somewhat like a marketing gimmick and it's also partly because of our lifestyle change. Lah. So a Soho unit by function is designed to be a home as well as an office because a lot of people now start to have office in their own home. Uh, then these units are actually sold as being home offices. So new units like Sovo, Sofo, like flexible office or versatile office, all those are office. So this category of definition, right, from residential, commercial, and mixed development, then are blurred again between this type of Soho, Sovo. And the main, main thing that consumers like us needs to understand, right, property buyers like us need to understand is whether they are fault under the HDA, the Housing Development Act. So this Housing Development Act was developed to protect first-time home buyers because back then, if you look into a lot of buildings in KL or Klang or wherever, right, a lot of buildings are being abandoned, especially since the last Asian economy crisis. And a lot of people, unfortunately, are affected. They pay the down payment and they service the installment, right? Then the developer just chow low like that, which is horrible. So the government then stepped in, created this act to govern all these new developers, right? So every time a developer wants to build a residential property, they need to follow these rules. For example, having a joint account with the government where all money collected from the consumers needs to flow to this account first before they can take. So even if the developer chow low, they just jabut, right? This money will still remain there. So for new home developments, right? All SPA will be governed, which means all SPA for new projects are standardized. It's all the same. So if you're buying a new property, right? From a developer, have no worries because all of them are the same, especially the schedule, the payment schedule. This becomes the main difference between a HDA and a non-HDA governed project. HDA, right, you can be very well assured your benefit will be covered, which means whenever the developer wants to claim money from your bank, it's going to be all right. And it's all in accordance to this payment schedule. For example, when foundation is ready, you need to pay 10%. For the walls to be ready, you need to pay 10%. Then for the wiring and windows and things like that, subsequently, right, all follows this payment schedule. But if you are buying from a non-HDA governed, this schedule is up to the developers to write. 
it means that they can come up with whatever schedule, right? And if you are not observant enough, you can just sign and then there you go. For suddenly, I can claim 60% payment just for foundation itself. It's actually okay. And if you sign the papers blindly, too bad. Lor. Then after HDA, non-HDA, we have the very famous freehold, leasehold. And I think this is rather direct. Freehold property means you own a particular property forever in perpetuity. As long as the building stands, it belongs to you. But for leasehold, it's divided into three terms. One is 99 years, 60 years, and 30 years. For example, if you buy a leasehold property, you can only own that unit up to 99 years. And when the tenure expires, you are given the opportunity, I think before, not, not entirely on the dot, but before that, you can already opt to renew. And to renew this costs quite a lot usually a few hundred thousand, but you kind of think of it, right? You pay maybe hundred, two hundred thousand. And I'm actually talking about a landed property here. You can renew your lease up to 99 years again. The main difference between freehold and leasehold besides the ownership, right? It also becomes a hindrance when you're trying to sell because every time you want to transact a leasehold property, you need to go through the state to get their consent. So that usually adds up another two to three months to the entire process. For example, now I'm in need of cash. I want to exit out my property. I sell on January, right? Usually a freehold one usually take like maybe five months on a safe side, right? Because now MCO, I also don't know whether office got work or not. But generally, it's four to five months. You can get everything sorted out already. So a leasehold property will be longer where you need to add around two to three months extra on top of whatever freehold process takes. After that, freehold, leasehold later, then you got the Bumi or non-Bumi unit. Bumi Putra unit, it's a quota, right? It's a requirement imposed by the government for all developments. But it differs from project to project. Some projects need to provide up to 50% Bumi Putra units. I do see some projects don't need to provide Bumi Putra units because they pay the premiums instead. So these kind of treatments differs from one local authority to another because it depends on the location of the particular project. For example, this particular project is in CBD, the land is premium, it's not really for the rakyat, generally it's for all the expats, right? So might as well don't need, I don't need to give. Lah. But then if this project is located in a residential area, for example, Shah Alam ke, PJ ke, Subang ke, it's a requirement for them to provide a certain number of Bumi units. So generally, Bumi units are around 10%, 15%. Again, this differs from state to state. I've seen in Johor, it's 30% discount. I've seen in Selangor, it's 10 or 15% discount. Bumi means our Malay friends gets to buy properties at a discounted rate. But the thing here is that if it's for own stay, right, definitely it's worth a lot. If it's for cash flow purposes, you want to buy and you want to rent outright, it's very good in terms of ROI because your entry price is already lower. But if you're thinking of exiting in the future, unfortunately this boomy status stays so for example now i'm a boomy i buy this boomy unit for the next transaction it's a must for a boomy to buy over then the question is can a non-boomy buy a boomy lot that depends on the jurisdiction of the land authority the state administrator has absolute power so you can give reasons like hey i really need this money to finance my studies so I need this house money, pay the medical bills of my mother, right? She's going through whatever illness and things like that. Then you can appeal and appeal and appeal. So there are cases where the Bumi status are uplifted. So it can be sold to a non-Bumi. Then there is this term also called Bumi Release Unit. So when a project is built and launched, right? So they will sell and sell and sell and sell. Suddenly, two, three years down the road. So generally a building requires three to four years for it to be completed, right? Usually before completion, right? Suddenly there will be, oh, Bumi release units are open right now. What does it mean? It means that initially the developer did not sell enough quotas of Bumi units. For example, 25% in a 500 unit apartment is 75 units. And in this 75 unit, they only sold maybe like half 40 units for example lah. so left 35 units right so 35 units the developers will then need to prove the effort of trying to sell these units via newspaper via social media or whatsoever to show that hey we have published in these different papers for the past six months it's not taken up then they are required to pay the premium and then the local authorities will then uplift the boomy status again and these units then become non-boomy and it's now open market product after that we have 
individual title versus strata title. Individual titles are the usual titles that we are pretty familiar like Those terrace house that my generations grew up in, right? All those terrace, terrace house, right? Generally are individual title, which means you own the particular piece of land and your house is built on top of it. You can do whatever you want as long as it complies with the local authority's guideline. A strata title usually then applies to high rise. You own a particular space in this apartment under this land title. So that is called a strata title. And then six years ago or seven years ago, we have this gated and guarded product, which means landed products that are gated and guarded. So those are governed as well by strata title. That's why now you have landed, right? You have individual title and strata titles. And then you have those difference again. And these kind of understandings will be very helpful if you look through the property reviews, right? Certain developments are individual title, but then later converted into gated and guarded. But then some are strata title and it's also gated and guarded. So now the line are pretty blur. So it's very important to know your terms because the main difference is some are protected by law, some are not. And I guess that's all for episode one. <laughs> to understand the types of properties out there. So we have covered the land title, which is like agriculture, building, and industrial, right? And then in building, it's then divided into residential and commercial and mixed development, where it then branch out to condos, service apartments, apartments, and etc. Then we have Sovo, Sofo. And in those developments, then we'll have Bumi, non-Bumi, freehold, leasehold, individual title, or strata title. And I think it's gonna get more and more complicated because of the buildings being more and more integrated. Well, last time we only have terrace houses, ma. so it's pretty direct. Individual title, leasehold, freehold, boomy, non boomy. Now you have strata title some also. In this strata title, it's gonna be way more complicated when it involves hotel, offices, malls, and etc. The entire function of the GMB or the management committee then will be even more challenging. Right, we'll cover that for the next episode. And thank you very much. See you on the next episode. Ciao.